Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello friends, today we will be discussing about wound healing, a very very basic phenomenon whenever there is a disease in our body, uh, our tissues repair themselves and so we will learn about this interesting process as to how our body totally heals itself after a disease process. So we will be learning today to define wound healing, we will look at the process of wound healing and we will be discussing something known as primary healing or secondary healing or otherwise also known as healing by primary or secondary intention. So let us look at the definition first. So healing simply means that it is the process of tissue repair or there is tissue regeneration. So what are we looking at? When we say repair, it means that the tissue is going to undergo certain changes which may not be exactly as normal but close to normal but in regeneration the tissue totally comes almost to a normal state. For example, when a hepatocyte is damaged a new hepatocyte replaces the old one so the hepatocyte regenerates while when there is an injury let us say on your skin surface the tissue looks almost close to normal and may not sometimes be true normal in the sense it leaves behind a scar tissue. So that is the process of repair. So it is uh, important to understand the difference between repair and regeneration. Now it occurs in uh, three broad phases and when I am talking about these three broad phases, please remember that there are no watertight compartments. So I cannot say that each one exists at separate entities. But it may kind of spill into the next phase in terms of the process that is occurring. So these are the three broad phases in which you can categorize it. It is starts with what is known as inflammation that is followed by cellular proliferation and then finally there is maturation of the tissue so that it looks more like normal. So what happens in each of these? So whenever there is an injury, the first thing that happens is in the inflammatory phase is the platelets. They come and they adhere to the injurious site or they aggregate, they form clumps and along with fibrin a clot is formed. Now as this clot is forming a lot of inflammatory cells will be attracted into this area. So this is the first phase of inflammation. So after that there is this phase of proliferation when there is an attempt to replace the normal structures. So there is granulation tissue formation, there is migration of cells which will form the connective tissue and then the epithelial tissue will also form, so re-epithelization. The final phase is that of maturation when the extracellular matrix is laid down, there is remodeling of the tissue and if the wound is very large there is something which is known as wound contraction. So we will look at this process, these three processes of inflammation, proliferation and maturation in greater detail. So when we talk of healing, there are different ways in which the tissue heals. So which is known as healing by primary intention or healing by secondary intention. So when do these two different methods occur? In healing by primary intention, the process occurs when there is a small injury or let us say somebody has put a surgical incision and then sutured it. So that is when healing by primary intention occurs. So basically the wound has to be very very small while healing by secondary intention occurs whenever the patient has a very large wound. So sometimes you uh, fall down and you have a big injury, an excavated injury 
or let us say you, uh, your patient has a huge ulcer. So, such a wound will heal by a process known as healing by of secondary intention, okay? healing by secondary intention. So, please remember there are two ways in which tissues heal either by primary intention when there is a small wound and by secondary intention when there is a larger wound. Now, whatever is the type of healing that is going to occur primary or secondary, these are some of the basic steps. So, the steps include first there is a blood clot which forms. Okay? So, immediately when there is injury blood oozes out and then after a few seconds the bleeding stops. So, the first thing that occurs in that area is a formation of the blood clot. Now, as the days pass, granulation tissue forms and following that cells start to proliferate. So, these cells are going to help to lay down the extracellular matrix following which collagen formation occurs and which then leads to scar formation. Now, to do these things there are three very, very important players in repair. So, what are these? So, the first thing are these fibroblasts which are going to lay down collagen. Then we have our inflammatory cells. So, they could be neutrophils followed by lymphocytes and macrophages. There could be some amount of plasma cells also. So, the first cell that comes in whenever there is injury is the neutrophil. The lobed cell is the neutrophil. So, that is the first cell which comes in following which you can have the macrophages or the lymphocytes which will come in next. And along with this the third important layer is the blood vessel. So, new blood vessels sprout in these areas of injury and which will help to provide nutrition to the newly forming tissue. So, please remember these are the three important structures or tissues that we will be talking about again and again in tissue repair. So, if you look at the normal skin, we will look at what happens to it whenever there is injury to the skin. So, in the skin we have two layers, you have an upper superficial layer which is known as the epidermis and below that you have what is known as the dermis and most, uh, we look, most injuries will cause damage of the epidermis with the dermis and we are looking uh, at such a kind of tissue repair process. So, let us see what happens. So, let us say a person has a small injury. So, you can see that the injury has damaged both the epidermis as well as the dermis. So, and what can you see here is you can see a blood filled area, the red blood filled area. So, that happens immediately. The moment there is an injury, the blood fills the gap. So, what is the purpose of the blood filling this area. So, the blood fills the area and then forms a clot. So, the clot is the first mechanism to stop bleeding, fine. So, that is the most important thing. It is the first important mechanism to stop the bleeding. Now, it also forms a scaffold for the other cells to migrate to help in the repair process, okay. So, it forms a scaffold for the other cells to migrate and form the repair process. There is also release of vascular endothelial growth factor VEGF. So, this is what is going to help blood vessels, new blood vessels to proliferate. So, the formation of a clot is a very, very important initial process. Fine. So, now as I told you earlier, the first cells which come in are the neutrophils. So, immediately after the clot is formed within 28 to 48 hours, neutrophils will start infiltrating into the area of injury and it will use the fibrin meshwork to travel inside the clot. And what does it do inside the clot? It releases proteolytic enzymes to digest or remove all the uh, dead tissue. So, that is the function of the neutrophils. So, we first had a clot, the neutrophils came in, they used the scaffold of this fibrin clot, moved into the area, released proteolytic enzymes to digest the dead and dying tissue. Now, along with that, we just uh, learned that 
vascular endothelial growth factor is released. So, this is going to result in proliferation of the blood vessels and all this happens anywhere between 24 up to 72 hours. So, more neutrophils can come in, more blood vessels start proliferating and initiates the process of repair. Now, another important thing which happens as the days pass, so for anywhere between 3 to 7 days, there is so much of inflammatory mediators being released. So, these inflammatory mediators will help bring in fibroblasts, they will help bring in fibroblasts. Now, in 3 to 7 days, these migration of fibroblasts is helped by tumor necrosis factor, platelet derived growth factor, transforming growth factor and fibroblast growth factor. While the proliferation, the proliferation of these fibroblasts are again mediated by a huge range of growth factors, PDGF, transforming growth factor, EGF, interleukins or tumor necrosis factor. So, if you look at a uh, repair tissue, it is very, very active. It has a high amount of tissue factors and all these tissue factors will help to bring in the fibroblasts. Another thing that happens during this 3 to 7 days uh, time is the presence of these large cells. Can you recognize them? These large cells, these large cells are the macrophages. So, macrophages are also there along with lymphocytes and over the days these neutrophils will get replaced by these macrophages and macrophages as you know are good tissue scavengers. They are there to remove all the dead and dying tissue. So, as these macrophages uh, come there, another thing that happens is the reepithelization process. So, the cells start to grow in, they undergo mitosis at the edge of the epidermal damage and new cells form and the process of reepithelization also starts. So, this time of 3 to 7 days is actually doing a lot of effective work in repairing our tissues. So, the neutrophils are replaced by macrophages, the macrophages release a whole lot of cytokines, the fibroblasts come in, these fibroblasts are going to lay down collagen and simultaneously the process of reepithelization from the surrounding epithelial cells starts to occur. Okay? Now, an important aspect, now as it said that fibroblasts grow in, a very important aspect is this deposition of collagen by these fibroblasts. So, it occurs simultaneously along with the laying down of the overlying epithelium. So, as the epidermal cells are forming in the dermis, the collagen is being laid down. So, at first the matrix has type 3 collagen, it still has a lot of fibrin, it has a lot of plasma fibronectin. And slowly over time, this gets replaced by type 1 collagen. So, the collagen starts with type 3 collagen and later gets replaced by type 1 collagen. And a very important player in this, uh, in stimulating these fibroblasts is this transforming growth factor beta. So, along with this, as I have told you that the macrophage is a very big player, a very big role in the repair process. So, if you look at the macrophage, it is able to release so many different kinds of cytokines, growth factors and which helps to remove the injured dead tissue. It has some amount of antimicrobial activity, it has chemotactic properties and helps in the proliferation of fibroblasts as well as keratinocytes that is the epithelial cells. It helps in the proliferation of blood vessels means angiogenesis as well as in deposition and remodeling of the ECM or the extracellular matrix, extracellular matrix. So, if you look at the macrophage, it has a huge role to play in tissue repair. 
So, as it is replacing the neutrophils, it simultaneously releases a lot of cytokines and helps in a multiple number of processes. So, starting from removing of debris to proliferation of the epithelial cells to the deposition of collagen to the uh, remodeling of the extracellular matrix is all done by the macrophage and hence it is supposed to be an important player in tissue repair. Okay? Now, as the collagen is being laid down, earlier the collagen was vertically aligned to the epidermis. So, initially when the collagen is laid down, it is either haphazardly laid down or it is vertically laid down. But as time goes by, so about a week, two weeks, this collagen starts to become more horizontal. So, it is laid down more horizontally and becomes much more organized. And if you look at this picture, the number of inflammatory cells have also reduced. Active collagen laying down has become less because the number of fibroblasts have also come down. The number of blood vessels are also less now. So, if you look at the picture, if you look at this picture, we have been talking about three important things. So can you enumerate them for me? We have been talking them about, we have been talking about blood vessels, yes, and we have been talking about inflammatory cells, and we have been talking about the matrix. Now, these three components form what is known as the granulation tissue. So, what you have been seeing along in all these pictures till now was what is the components of granulation tissue. Now, the word granulation tissue came from the morphologic look of granulation tissue. So, if you look at a patient who is having a large ulcer and has a very healthy granulation tissue, it has a very pink and granular look. So, that is why the word granulation tissue came, came about. Now, the three important components, this is from an actual patient's slide uh, which is showing active granulation tissue. You can identify the three structures. These gaps that you are seeing here are the blood vessels. So, you can see so many blood vessels proliferating. So, each of these gaps is a blood vessel, while those dots that you see in the lightish gray stroma are the inflammatory cells, while the background itself is what we talk of as extracellular matrix. So, this is the microscopy of what you would see in wound repair. So, on the left hand side, you are seeing a lower power picture which shows you the edge of the damaged tissue, extensive inflammation close to it and the granulation tissue lying below it. So, that is how it is organized. So, if you were to take a biopsy of a patient uh, from an ulcer, so this is exactly what it is supposed to show. You see a superficial uh, ulcerated area which could have some necrotic material below which you see a lot of extensive uh, inflammation and then below it you see the active granulation tissue. Now, as it becomes more and more mature, you will see less blood vessels, more of the uh, extracellular matrix as it is laid down by the fibroblasts. Yes? Okay. So, now when we started this lecture, we spoke about healing by primary intention and secondary intention. So, till now we have learnt that there is a process where there is a clot formation, where there is for deposition of extracellular matrix molecules with the help of the inflammatory cells and there is this granulation tissue which is very, very rich in inflammatory cells, which is rich in blood vessels, rich in extracellular matrix molecules. Now, all these processes occur both in healing by primary intention and in healing by secondary intention. But if you remember the basic difference that I told you about when he healing by primary intention occurs and when healing by secondary intention occurs, the difference was in the size of the wound. Pri healing by primary occurs in a very small wound or a surgically sutured wound, while healing by secondary intention occurs in 
large wounds which cannot be sutured easily. So, here is a process which occurs mainly in healing by secondary intention. So, in primary intention since the wound is very small the body does not have to put extra effort to close it. The granulation tissue formed will close it. While in healing by secondary intention you have something known as wound contraction. You have something known as wound contraction. Now, this wound contraction is done by special cells known as myofibroblasts special cells which are known as myofibroblasts and they help to bring the edges of the wound together. So, let us see a little bit about myofibroblasts. Myofibroblasts ultrastructurally have certain characteristics similar to that of smooth muscle cells and that is what helps them to contract. They also help to produce extracellular matrix components like type 1 collagen or tenacinin. They are uh, supposed to be derived from the fibroblasts by the action of certain uh, 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 cytokines like TGF beta or growth factors PDGF and some people also feel that they may be derived from the bone marrow cells. Uh, there are different theories to this, but basically these myofibroblasts are cells with large cells with contractile properties which is going to help us reduce the size of the wound in type 2 healing in secondary healing. So, this is something that does not happen in uh, healing by primary intention. So, please remember wound contraction is mainly a feature of healing by secondary intention. Now, following this there is uh, something known as connective tissue remodeling. Now, this remodeling keeps a balance between the extracellular matrix synthesis as well as degradation. Now, why is it important? This is important so that the tissue does not grow over and above the normal surfaces. So, you have always noticed that whenever your tissue heals, it heals perfectly in alignment with the surrounding tissues. So, this balance is maintained between certain substances which are secreted within our body which does not allow excessive proliferation. Now, the balance of degradation is maintained by the MMPs also known as the matrix metalloproteinases and these are secreted by the inflammatory cells. We discussed so many inflammatory cells, we spoke about the neutrophils, we spoke about lymphocytes, we spoke about the macrophages. So, they produce these MMPs. Now, excessive proliferation is then inhibited by the tissue inhibitors of metalloproteinases. So, the balance between these two, the MMPs and the inhibitors of MMPs maintains this balance and ensures that there is no excessive production of tissue. So, this phase is known as the phase of connective tissue remodeling. Now, once remodeling is achieved, do you think that the tissue becomes perfectly normal? So, all of us would have had injuries at some point of time. So, does the functioning of your tissue become like your normal tissue within 2 weeks or 3 weeks? Just think about it, usually not. So, most of us would have fallen down, injured ourselves, some of us must be having scars on our bodies. So, it is uh, good to think back and see whether these tissues achieve the total normal architecture. So, let us look at what happens to the recovery of the tensile strength of our wounds. So, at the end of one week, the wound strength is about 10 percent of normal, while it slowly increases in the next one month. So, over the next four weeks, the strength slowly increases and it will reach to about 70 to 80 percent of the original strength, while complete recovery can take almost two or uh, three months. Now, when we are talking of complete recovery, another interesting thing that we need to remember, especially when we are looking at healing by secondary intention, where there has been massive tissue injury some of the normal structures may not regenerate. For example, in your skin, we have hair follicles. 
So, in the scar area hair follicles may not regenerate. So, it is important to remember that occasionally the tissue may not come back to the original tensile strength. So, complete recovery can take almost up to 3 months. So, let us look at some of the differences between healing by primary intention and healing by secondary intention. So, primary intention occurs whenever the wound is small, there is very little granulation tissue and the important thing to remember that the scar is minimal. So, we are not saying that the scar is absent, the scar is minimal. While if you look at healing by secondary intention, it is usually seen when the injury or the wound is very large, a huge ulcer. You have seen patients having large ulcers on the foot. So, these are the patients where healing will occur by secondary intention. You see extensive large amount of granulation tissue in these wounds and this will leave lot of scar tissue and wound healing is taken care of by myofibroblasts which help in wound contraction which is not seen in healing by primary intention. So, please remember that the healing process is almost similar in primary and secondary intention except that healing by secondary intention has the presence of myofibroblasts which results in wound contraction while Granulation tissue scar is minimal in primary intention while in secondary intention it has lots and lots of granulation tissue and can form extensive scars. So, everything is minimal in primary intention and everything is in huge amounts in secondary intention. Another point that I would like you to remember that granulation tissue and granuloma are not the same they are not the same. So, granulation tissue is seen in repair process while granulomas are seen in, in infective processes like tuberculosis or maybe sarcoids or a giant cell reaction. So, not to confuse these two terminologies, in repair we only see granulation tissue which is the hallmark of tissue repair. Now, we have been talking about skin healing all this while. So, the question occurs how does tissue heal in the other areas? So, let us say somebody has a ulcer in the stomach, how does that heal? Remember anywhere in our body when there is a tissue injury granulation tissue can form and here is a picture from a patient who had a gastric ulcer. So, if you look at this ulcer you can see some remnants of the epithelium here and everywhere to the side you can see the tissue flooded with inflammatory cells. A higher power picture on the other side, you can see the epithelial cells, you can see some glands below it, but the remaining zones are all filled with intense inflammation. In fact, on the other side you just cannot see any lining epithelial cells which means it has totally formed an ulcer replaced by lot of inflammatory cells which is sitting on the extracellular matrix and you can see some tiny blood vessels proliferating. So, this is another example of granulation tissue. So, whenever you have huge tissue injuries or any kind of tissue injury within a body, the attempt by the body is to heal it forming a granulation tissue and it undergoes the same repair process. The end result of scarring or not scarring varies from different body areas. Some tissues heal without any fibrosis, some tissues heal with fibrosis. So, to end this we have learnt today that wound healing can either be a repair or regeneration of the tissue. Granulation tissue which is composed of blood vessels inflammatory cells and extracellular matrix molecules is the hallmark of any repair phenomenon. Okay? And the repairing process can either be a primary process or a secondary process. A primary repair process occurs whenever there is a small injury and there is very little granulation tissue, very little scar formation. While in the secondary process, 
is whenever there is huge tissue loss, there is a lot of granulation tissue, there is presence of myofibroblasts which helps in wound contraction and it can result in a lot of tissue scarring. Thank you.